I would like to invite you to a very happy session of learning the Word of God. Uh, there was never a time when we need to know so much as we need to know right now. It's time now to know truth uh, in a way that we have not known it before. Truth is fire. It burns. Uh, and, and we need to know dynamic truth from God. And the very basis of a knowledge of God is to know God's covenants, just like knowing God's dispensations. Until you come into a knowledge of the covenants of God, it's difficult to understand God's relationship with you or God's relationship with Abraham or, or Noah or, or with Adam. So we come to understand God through the relationships that God has had in the past uh, with his servants. And then our own relationships when we study the new covenant. Uh, but uh, for us to take them successively like this is, is uh, more than just a pill. Uh, it's a uh, hyperdemic, I think, or something like that. Uh, you are, you're getting it very hard and very quickly. Normally in classes you take one of these a week or something like that. And, and now you're getting them very close together. Uh, we have come to the covenant made with Noah, called the Noahic Covenant. We've gone through the lessons of what is a covenant, uh, the Edenic Covenant, the Adamic Covenant. Now we are going to jump at least 2,000 years to the Noahic Covenant. Man has broken his covenant relationship with God and uh, almost 2,000 years of sin, of transgression, of immoralities, and God is now ready to begin again a new relationship with God. And uh, it, it restates some of the things that God had said to Adam, and that's a beautiful thing that they are restated again. We read of the Noahic covenant in the book of Genesis, chapter 9. If you were to begin reading with me in verse 1, we would study the Noahic covenant. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, to all of them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That sounds like he was telling Adam, you know, 2,000 years before. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. That was the same as in the Adamic covenant also. And upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, upon the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. And so in the covenant of Noah, he retained the good things that were in the covenant of, of Adam. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Uh, this was a new idea. We'll be speaking about it in our lesson here uh, where man could now eat meat. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now you could uh, read that to a vegetarian if you like and underline it for them that they can eat all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood. Uh, did you know that only recently has medical science discovered that it was actually in the blood where the life is? And God had said it in the book of Genesis, if they had just listened, that your life is your blood. Your bloodstream is your life. Uh, when your blood stops moving, you're dead. That uh, your, your, your life force is in your blood. And because it is life, you shall not eat blood. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it. That means if a beast were to kill a human, that beast must die, must be executed. And at the hand of man, that man himself should take the beast and destroy him if he kills, if he's a killer. At the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of a man. And there's your first capital punishment that's placed within there. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. When people ask you why does a government have the right to initiate capital punishment, it says, well, read the Bible. God said it. For in the image of God made he man. And because he's in that image, he's precious. And you must not take life. And you... Be fruitful, multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, multiply therein. And God spoke unto Noah and to his sons, saying, And behold, I establish my covenant with you. So here's the Noah covenant. 
and with your seed after you. And it continued for 10 generations until, until Abraham and God gave a new covenant. And with every living creature that is with you. So the, the, the creation entered into the covenant. Isn't that beautiful? It wasn't just a human being, but the creation entered into the covenant. As I was telling you about Israel, the land is in the covenant with the people. The people is in the covenant with the land. It's a very remarkable thing. And the blessings of our country today with our agriculture uh, is, is, uh, is, is because of our relationship with God. There are places in the world where, where they could have just as great a crops as we are having, but they don't have them. Every living creature that is with you, of the fowl and of the cattle and of the beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Now there's, a, there's the basis of the covenant right there. God says that never will all the earth be cut off again by the waters of a flood. Uh, neither shall there any more be a flood of waters to destroy the earth. That, that will never happen again. If there's a flood, it'll always be a local situation. It will never be a national or international situation. And so God said, this is the token of this covenant, which I make between me and you. Uh, tokens, I mean, covenants very often have tokens with them, or assurances, or stamps. Or, or th that you will know the, the covenant by the stamp it bears. And that every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. <laughs> That's us. Perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. You see, it hadn't been there before. He says, I do now do it. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it should be for a token of a covenant. It should be the guarantee. It should be the guarantee of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Darkness and light. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The covenant was with all flesh, all the living creatures. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. That's reading to you from Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 through verse 17. No one knew from the beginning that God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God because uh, he knew uh, through his relationships uh, with his fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, uh, he knew that God had made a covenant in Eden, that God had made a covenant with Adam, and so it was not a, a new, it was not a beginning thing. He knew that God, the God that he served, was a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. And so God gave Noah a clear word of promise as to what he would do. It was a warning. It was a message not only demonstrated in Noah's time, but also in the New Testament fulfillment, which affects our own generation today. And we'll be speaking somewhat about that. God gave the word to Noah and said, this is the way it ought to be. In Noah's time, they knew sin. In Genesis 6 and 5, before the flood, God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every imagination of, the, of his thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, God knew that, and Noah knew that. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and Noah was deeply touched and hurt. And that was the only reason he was chosen to save mankind, because he was a man of righteousness, he was a man that knew that God had made a covenant with man and that God, and that God did not want man to be destroyed. And so that he became God's partner in delivering man and setting man free. In Genesis 6 and 6, it says it repented God that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart because man had sinned so exceedingly, had broken his laws so terribly, had gone from him and rebelled against him. 
And so God shut Noah and his family up into the ark. And one of the most amazing stories ever in the history of mankind of how he sustained him and, and kept him during that time. Uh, in Genesis 6 and 14 to 16, it tells you how God told Noah exactly how to build that ark, the shape it was to be, the measurements that it was to be. And it was not until 1850 A.D., just over 100 years ago, that man ever built a boat the size of Noah's boat. <laughs> Thousands of years passed before man could ever build a boat the size of Noah's boat. And God told Noah what to put inside of that ark, how many to put in there. And uh, that's in Genesis 6, 1821. And then God told Noah when to leave the ark and to go outside and, and to start all over again. There are seven very remarkable things related to, to, Noah's, uh, uh, to Noah's covenant. Let us look at them together. Number one, that God would not again curse the earth and all the living creatures with a flood as long as the earth remained. This was a promise from God. It was a covenant promise. Now, it's been 4,000 years ago, and God's kept it this long, and it says it's forever. He won't ever destroy this world with water again. We read in Genesis 8 and 21, the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. He should have said for man's sin, for, for man's wickedness, for man's re rebellion. I, I, I will not do it again for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I've done. And that's in Genesis 8, 21, 22. And so God would never again cover the earth with water in a, in a judgment day. Number two, that man should replenish the earth forever. That's in Genesis 9 and 1. That man had a job to do, and that was to replenish the earth, to fill it full of people, uh, full of animals, uh, full of vegetation. That, that man had a re relationship with God in the covenant. Man's relationship was to give this earth what it needed. He was to be a, a builder on the face of this earth, a producer on the face of this earth. He was to make things on the face of this earth. So uh, uh, he would replenish the earth uh, with animals and with mankind. And number three, uh, that man again, under Adam it was that way, but man again under this covenant would be the ruler of the earth, that there would be no living creature on the face of this earth. Uh, big game hunters tell us that wild animals fear man, they fear his presence and that normally they don't attack a man unless they've gotten into a corner or they're real frightened or they, they have a young one that they're trying to protect for some reason, but that in an animal's heart, uh, they know that man, who man may be much smaller, like a giraffe is much larger, or an elephant, that that animal knows that man is his boss. That when man approaches, he's very conscious that man is a ruler. And that's put into the, into the very nature of an animal to know that. And it's in a man... Uh, life. Uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, what man wants to do. You know, man wants to fly. Uh, he just wants to fly. He, he wants to get up there and, and, and look down upon the earth. Uh, I, I shall never forget coming home the Orient one time and I, I couldn't sleep. I was looking out the plane window and I saw the moon and the stars down below me. I said, hey, that's going somewhere. I am above the moon and the stars. They're, they're, they're down below me. And God spoke to my heart and said, you come on down. But that's not where you're supposed to be, above the moon and the stars. You're supposed to be down there where the hurt, where the sorrow, where the pain, where the dirt. You're supposed to be down there. So the plane soon, soon came down. I was right down there. Uh, <laughs> I've been down there ever since. Uh, but in, in this life, we're to live where there's human need. And, and when the church ever gets away from that, it's out of the place that God ever intended for the church to be. But in this covenant, uh, man would rule the earth. Also, uh, animals could be eaten, but not the blood. That's in Genesis 9, uh, 3 and 4, that animals could now be a food. Uh, and, and of course, their skins would be clothing of various kinds. And it's amazing how we want to do that, uh, how we want to eat the flesh and how we want to wear. Uh, we, want, we want fur coats and, and we want skin shoes. And, and uh, man has a desire for that, <coughs> which was given to him under the, uh, 
under the terms here of the uh, covenant made with Noah. Also, in, in this one, and in, in this uh, covenant, we have a very remarkable thing, and that's capital punishment for murderers in Genesis 9 and 6. Now, that was something new for the earth, that if you struck a man and he died, that you had to give up your life. And this helped people to understand that they couldn't just go around killing people because man is an immortal creature. He, can, he lives forever somewhere, and that uh, life is precious in God's sight, and that you're not to take it. And the, the covenant that it was uh, sealed under was the rainbow. And that the covenant was to be an eternal, eternal situation. So those are the seven uh, terms uh, related to the, to the uh, Noahic covenant. In the New Testament, uh, this, this covenant is, is very exciting. In 2 Peter 2 and 5, uh, it tells us that Noah, that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And, and so in the New Testament, we still are reflecting back to a man that knew God, Noah, and that to a situation where Noah was victorious and, and won over it. It also tells us in the New Testament that this man Noah was a man of, and a person of faith. In Hebrews 11 and 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things seen, not seen as yet, now, see, that's where faith works. Uh, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Uh, you see, if you've seen a thing, you don't need faith about it. But he had never seen anything like this, and yet he believed it. He was moved with fear. He prepared an ark, 120 years' work, uh, to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And so the, the covenant made with Noah is uh, reflected in the New Testament in the, uh, telling you how God respected this man. And the first two words just is by faith. Uh, here was a man motivated and moved by this glorious thing that we term and call faith. And God wanted us to have a sweet understanding of this man, even in the New Testament. His strength had not gone away. Uh, his prestige had not gone away. That he was a man that God loved and cared for. And we read of Christ speaking of Noah in Matthew 24 and 37. Uh, Jesus said, but now listen, as it was in the days of Noah, uh, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And then he goes ahead and describes it. He says, they were eating and drinking, and they were marrying and divorcing, right unto the day that Noah entered the ark. And they didn't understand and they didn't know until the floods came and took them all away. Now, Jesus said his next coming, his, his next coming to the earth would be similar to what happened in Noah's day. And, and so, even though we're living under a different covenant, living under the, the Christian covenant, the new covenant of today, Jesus says, I want you to know that you're going to see a repetition of the time in which I made that covenant with a man, uh, with, with Noah's covenant. You're going to see the same thing. And though the world will not be destroyed by water, he says it will be destroyed a, another way. It'll be destroyed by fire. The earth will be consumed by fire. When you read of the functions of the Great Tribulation, you find the full and the whole and the entire story there of how the world will be destroyed. This earth will be destroyed uh, by fire. And so in the New Testament, we have a, a, a hold and a grasp of this man that, uh, that did so wonderfully well under a covenant with God in the Old, in the Old Testament. And uh, we're still enjoying the fruits of some of that covenant and an understanding of God through that covenant. Uh, for example, to understand capital punishment. You know, a man without God today can't understand capital punishment. Uh, he immediately says, no, there shouldn't be any capital punishment. And, uh, and God says that if you initiated capital punishment, you'd put a stop to murder. If every man knows that the day that he takes someone else's life, his life will be taken, uh, you reduce it by 99%. You see, you reduce it. But if he knows that he can uh, pay a lawyer and, and be called temporarily insane, when he's not at all, then he knows that down the road a few years from now, he'll, he'll get out of it, so he's willing to take the chance on it. But if he has a knowledge that he's going to die the same day, uh, he's a little careful. Uh, when, I, when I was up in Alaska, uh, this was before the war, I found they had a different way of living than we, than we do down here. I was up above the Arctic Circle, and we were, we were, we were going out on the town. Uh, <laughs> uh, that meant uh, right in a sled pulled by dogs. And, and, and so uh, we walked out the door of this cabin and he didn't close it. 
And I said, aren't you going to lock the door? Oh, he said, there's, uh, there's no lock on the door. And, uh, no lock of any kind. It just came shut. And I said, I said my camera. I, I'm leaving my camera in there, my, my movie camera. And I said, it, it's expensive. Well, he says, uh, nobody's going to bother it. But I said, why if somebody steals it? Well, he says, I'll shoot him. I said, what? He pulled his coat back and he says, everybody up here wears one of these. And he says, you know why it's safe? I says, what? He says, there's nowhere to go. You can't get out of the country. And if anybody gets your camera, whoever sees him first will shoot him. And I says, you know, he says, you know, nobody's going to touch your camera. And he says, I'll tell you something else. We all respect each other up here. We've all got a gun on our side. He says, you have trouble when only one guy's got the gun. That's when you have trouble. But when everybody's got a gun, then you respect one another. Well, now, now that has almost escaped off the face of the earth. Uh, Alaska is no longer a territory, it's a state. And I, I presume they don't wear their guns on the side like they did in, in that time. But capital punishment, God established it, not man. It has no relationship to men passing laws. God said it. And it only wanted you to respect human beings. You should teach little children not to hurt other children. And God wants us to remember that and to know that it's part of the covenant. Part of the, part of the covenant that God made with Noah says that if you take another man's life, and even if an animal is a destroyer or a killer and kills a man, he dies. That animal does not live. Now, when I was a boy, they did things like that. If there was a killer horse, they shot him. They didn't even kill a second person. If there was a killer bull, they shot that bull. They, 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 didn't, they didn't play around and say, well, that was an accident. Maybe it won't hurt you next time. Uh, that bull died. And, and, but we've, we're living in a little different world right now that is not living under the blessings of God and not living under the covenants of God for sure. And, and they're living without them. But the Lord Jesus spoke of the days in and, and which he would return again as to be comparable to the days of Noah when Noah was faithful. And you might be glad to know that the word Noah means quiet. In a world of turmoil, and in a world of tempestuous activity, he was a quiet person, just tender and quiet and soft before the Lord. They yelled and screamed, and he smiled. And, 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 and they were in a state of confusion. Uh, just, just recently, I've been hearing some things that are real, real interesting. Uh, I, I've been hearing of some pastors that were exceedingly busy. They were just terribly busy. They, they couldn't even hardly slow down to, to speak to anybody. And I immediately say, he is not busy. He is confused. He is just plain confused. When you let your body just wear itself out, just, just running at full speed, there's something wrong with you. And it's not Jesus. Jesus will stop all that stuff. You don't ever see me running anywhere. Uh, I, I work, but I don't run, you see. You say, why? Well, Jesus didn't run either. He just took it real easy. If you want the breath of God upon you, you don't, you don't get nervous. And, and, and these people say, I, I'm just so busy, I'm just so busy. No, you're just disorganized. You just think that thing over and get it running straight. A number of years ago, uh, Brother Oral Roberts and I were good friends. And when we'd be in a place like Manila together, and, or even here in South Bend, he wanted to play golf every morning uh, for the simple reason he wanted to be toned and toned up for that night's meeting. And so I, I would go and, and play golf with him. And I didn't have much to do myself. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd look up at him and say, you know, uh, you're a busy man, aren't you? Well, he says a little bit. Now, he was running an empire, mind you. He was running an empire, but he was playing golf every morning. And, and uh, they would bring word out to the golf course to him. And he'd just, in about three words, tell them what to do. And he didn't bother him a bit. He just do this and do that. And, and I suddenly realized that he was doing a lot of work, but not because Orr was running, because his mind had already laid it out and says, you do this and you do that and you do the other. I'll play golf. <laughs> well, it's pretty nice on the one that can do it, you know. And, uh, but an organized life in, these world, in this world that we live today, we are little Noahs and we're quiet and we're not running crazy and we're not nervous about anything and we're not struggling against anything. We're living for Jesus, we're living in Jesus, and we're living in all the blessings of the covenant, and we're not afraid to live, we're not afraid to die, and we're in no hurry. We're just moving right straight toward the city of God, persistently, and just like God wants us to go. Can you say amen? amen. The ungodly were very nervous. They were running full speed right straight into hell. 
but Noah was not nervous. He was moving quietly into the presence of the Almighty. So that covenant uh, was succeeded by a further covenant called the Abrahamic covenant, which is possibly the greatest covenant that we have before the covenant of Jesus. But that covenant remains with us in some parts because we have the remains of the rainbow that are with us. And we have some of these other situations where man must replenish the earth, man must rule the earth, uh, animals uh, can be used as a food product, not, not the blood, just the, 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 the other parts of the animal. The capital punishment is an advisory thing to do to stop men from destroying one another and that the rainbow as an eternal reminder and seal of the covenant is still there and remains there and will keep remaining there until, until this uh, world is gone, until this present surface of the world is gone, until this present world passes away, that will remain there. And so we do have the remains of that beautiful covenant. In our next lesson, we will proceed into the Abrahamic covenant, uh, which is certainly one of the greatest, one of the most exciting, one of the most beautiful, and I'm sure that you will enjoy it uh, very much.